I acknowledge that two matters on the country of the Kuwaita people who did not survive British colonisation, and I pay my respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. I honour Aboriginal elders, past and present, and value the history, culture, and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. I'd like to introduce to you Grace Tain. Grace Tain is an outspoken advocate for survivors of sexual assault, particularly those who are abused in institutional settings. From age 15, Grace was groomed and raped by her 58-year-old maths teacher, who was found guilty and jailed for these crimes. However, under Tasmania's sexual assault victim gag laws, Grace couldn't legally speak out about her experience, despite the perpetrator and media being free to do so. Grace has demonstrated extraordinary courage, using her voice to push for legal reform and raise public awareness about the impacts of sexual violence. Grace was recognised for her advocacy work earlier this year and named the 2021 Australian of the Year. Grace is a regular guest speaker for the high profile, for high profile events and television programs and uses her media profile to advocate for other vulnerable groups in the community. Can we please have a round of applause? You are at the halfway point of your journey as Australian of the Year. Firstly, how are you feeling? Tired. <laughs> Only halfway. Um, I'm oh, feeling lots of things. Um, it's been a wild year, if we can all agree, for many reasons. Um, I certainly didn't um, have any expectation of what this would be like going into the Australian of the Year Awards program. Um, you know, I was the youngest in my category and surrounded by you know fellow nominees who are very well established career professionals have done incredible things and I just thought, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not going with this. So it's just along for the ride. And then not only did I win the award, but the events that have followed, um, you know, with allegations in Parliament and other such things, you know, it's just given a whole, it's injected a whole, another level of, of um, intensity to what I was already doing. Yeah. What have what have been the most, I guess, positive parts of your experience so far? Um, it's a great honour and a great privilege to be able to see firsthand the impact that you are making, the work that you do. So, you know, before these most recent lockdowns, I was travelling a lot around the country and I remember walking down the road in Sydney, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously from Tassie, um, and so I thought, you know, no one's going to recognise me. And this older lady who would have been in her 70s came up to me and she was gobsmacked. She didn't talk for about 10 seconds. She was just pointing at me and she went, you're Grace. And I went, yes. <laughs> And she proceeded to tell me her story of surviving child sexual abuse. And we were just in the middle of, you know, downtown Sydney. And she told me this story and then she said, I've never told anyone that before. And then we just stood in the street and hugged. And that's just one person. You know, I had a man in um, Brisbane, I think it was. No, it was Perth. It was Perth. And he lined up to see me after I did a speaking engagement and he was shaking when I started talking to him and I, um, I, I said I think I know what, what's on your mind and we had a hug um, and then afterwards he was talking to my father because um, my father came, came with me and um, he then left and, and my father told me in the taxi on the way back to the hotel that this man hadn't, sh hadn't uh, like sh shaped anyone's shaking, shaking, shaped, shook, <laughs> and shaped. Hadn't even done that thing. Yeah. Hadn't even done that for ten years. <coughs> ten years, and we had a hug. I mean, that's just that's just wild. I think. Yeah. 
beautiful to be able to see that, that this is making an impact in people's lives. You know, there are people who have thought that they were going to take their stories of abuse to the grave and suddenly were being given this permission to be vulnerable again and, you know, remember that we're all human beings. Extremely positive to see that, you know, we're not alone in this. That is exactly. Yeah. yeah, we all have a story, you know, that, I mean, hugely different stories, but they're all stories at the end of the day. <coughs> so, some challenges. Have you experienced any challenges this year? And if so, how have you overcome them? Not to be diplomatic. <laughs> I don't want to name any challenges by name. <laughs> yeah, I'll get to them later, I think. Um, no, I would have to say, um, that, you know, to be completely honest, it has been incredibly hard to deal with this cross-section of experiences, and I'm talking about the cross-section of being thrust into the limelight, um, but also being a young person who's still you know, only 26 and processing trauma that will last a lifetime and that develops with age. You know, certain things that I went through as a 15 year old are now only making sense as an adult. I like to say, the older I get, the younger I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so often I'll be live on national television and I'll get asked a very unhelpful question by the media and I will then have my trauma framed in a context that I've never thought about it in before and have to process it in that moment. And that's hard, being under intense public scrutiny, you know, because I'm, I'm expected to be the perfect victim. I'm supposed to be a counsellor. I'm expected to have all the answers. And I'm expected to speak for people but whose, you know, experiences I can't speak to. You know, I can speak to my experience, but I can't speak to the, um, you know, compounding intersections of disadvantage. You know, I, I can't speak for First Nations survivors, people with disabilities, the LGBTQIA plus community. You know, and so it is, it can be quite difficult. What have been some of your grounding tools in those moments when you feel confronted by? Um, Max, over there, single one out. Um, he's, <laughs> I wouldn't describe it as a grounding tool, though. Um, <laughs> um, no, um, he keeps me sane, for sure. Um, and uh, just, yeah, just loved ones, really, in general. You know, my family, I'm very much a family-oriented person, always have been, so that, in a way, hasn't changed. You know, my world still revolves around the people that I love, you know, so that's how I stay grounded. Um, you know, keep your head out of the clouds kind of thing. And... Um, you know, keeping in touch with simple values, nature, um, exercise, sleep, eating well, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, keeps helping you return back to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So on the stage, well it's not really on the stage, on the side of the stage we have this petition and everyone this is Grace's petition. Um, can you explain what this position means for you? Well, um, as many of you would, ooh, I, you might not know actually, but some of you might be familiar with the Let Her Speak campaign that was launched back in 2018, uh, because here in Tasmania previously, under section 194K of um, Tasmania's Evidence Act, um, survivors of child sexual abuse were prevented from sharing their stories publicly under their own name, even with their consent and even after they turned 18. Now, I saw this as a grave injustice because silence is a favoured weapon of evil. Um, and as we know, perpetrators of sex crimes are characteristically manipulative and they do at any given opportunity manipulate the narrative, especially if their survivors are not able to say anything. And in the case of my perpetrator, for example, he he did. Um, you know, he even though I, I'm one of at least five other girls who he targeted and exploited. Um, you know, he he played the victim, um, and he did you know interviews with commentators where he, ex he even explained away 
uh, the fact that he was found with 28 multimedia files of child exploitation material on his computer, including a trophy file of other girls. Topless. Um, you know, so there's an example of how perpetrators exploit these uh, laws. Um, and so Nina Fennell, who is an incredible investigative journalist, I teamed up with her uh, and she created this campaign, this Let Her Speak campaign. And before we actually succeeded in uh, reforming the law, because it was changed in April 2000, it was, must have been last year, yeah, April 2020. Yeah. Um, well, April 2019, so a year before that, I was actually granted an exemption by the Supreme Court to share my story publicly. And as uh, sort of a, a, like a, a gift to mark the occasion, Nina um, got the first 5,000 names and printed them in a book. And next to each name is the, um, like the postcode of where the person lives and then their occupation. Um, and as you can see, it's the size and depth of the phone book. So what that, what that really is, is an optic reference of change. Because often we, you know, we talk about change and it's really hard to measure because it's slow and it's got peaks and troughs, you know. It's kind of like a wave that comes and goes. It's, but this is, is like solidarity inked permanently on every page because you know not only did thousands of strangers from across the world in fact sign that from you know many diverse backgrounds there are people who signed the petition who were peers of mine who at the time when i first spoke out because the culture was very different then there's still a lot of um you know victim stereotypes victim blaming attitudes um, a lot of people who didn't understand at the time, in fact, people that bullied me, they signed that petition and they reached out to apologise. And I can't think of a better representation of change and progress than that. I think that's phenomenal. How did you get to 5,000 signatures? Well, we actually got to a total of 8,154, to be precise. Wow. Um, we sort of had a, a three-pronged approach, I suppose. So there was the, the obvious media advocacy, which was um, you know, very deliberate to raise awareness about the issue. But then we also had um, the, the legal aspect. So we were taking uh, specific cases to court to highlight the injustices. Um, so, you know, my case was the foundation, but we actually were joined by 16 other brave survivors who lent their stories to the cause. Um, and, you know, court orders were granted for these survivors as well. Um, and then there was the, the government approach, so lobbying the government and, and actually asking for submissions, um, you, you know, so that, so that organisations, for example, like peak bodies in the prevention of, of child exploitation space and sexual abuse space could write. Um, in support, and I think that there was a record number of submissions. It was like 64 submissions or something like that, which was incredible. Yeah, got a lot of support. Did you? You've outlined some of the strategies you use. It was three pronged, um, mostly high level, and also grassroots, allowing people to access this petition and know mm -hmm. your story. Were there any other specific strategies or that you used to implement this social change? Just being bloody relentless. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just not stopping. Yeah, not, not a specific strategy at all, just never giving up, I suppose. At any point in the journey, like, did you feel, should I take a step back? Were you always fearlessly moving back? Or did you ever feel like, when, when the story hit the media, like, well, what were the first thoughts that came to your mind? Um, I didn't doubt it for a second because that's what drove me to speak up in the first place, you know, as a 16 year old. Um, I didn't, as, as I've sort of explained, I didn't fully understand um, just how wrong it was, but I knew fundamentally that it was, was wrong and that I wanted to help people and educate people. Because also, right before the Let Her Speak campaign launched, 
it was it was only then, um, you know, uh, I must have been 20 or something like that, 21. Um, oh, I must have been older than that. Anyway, um, but it was only then, you know, years and years after I'd been through the abuse that I thought to look up the term grooming. I'd heard it, I'd heard it loosely, you know, and I, I, I knew, you know, because people talked about it in relation to my case, but I didn't really get, like I'd never thought to look it up. And I remember looking up the term grooming and it was equal parts validating and confronting because, and I, I was looking at some in-depth studies of it and every single example I could relate to. And I thought, people need to know about this because this is why predators get away with it for so long. Because people don't understand. They capitalise on our ignorance. You know, and, and that's why we fight amongst ourselves. That's why families implode because, you know, we point, point the finger at each other. And then predators just sit back and, you know, we're doing the work for them. I thought people have to know about this. So I've just, that, that's always been driving me. You know, and I think that in life, regardless of what you're doing, if you know why you're doing it, you, you just, you know, you never think twice. Mm. What were some of the lessons that you've learned from lending your voice and being a leading voice in this campaign? I've learned that we're all leaders. You know, we all have the capacity to lead. Um, and leading looks like different things, you know. Um, but more importantly than anything else in this book, Example is an example of this is, is that every single voice matters and no contribution is too small. Yes, there's 5,000 signatures, but each, each one of those signatures is just one person contributing to that, you know, and that's the power of the collective. Uh, so, yeah, I think that valuing every contribution from the, from the bottom to the very top is important. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Even the little guys count. Yeah. Yeah, I like to use the analogy to encourage people when people can sometimes go, oh, what's my, you know, what's my donation here? Or what's my signature? Why am I signing this? Why am I bother? It's not going to make any difference. But I like to think of, I like to encourage people to think of their contributions as being catalysts, you know, as being like dominoes in a line or tiny sparks in a, in a current of electricity that's unbroken, you know. Mm -hmm. It's all important. You take one of those dominoes away and there's a whole line that's, Right, waiting to be knocked over. After leading such a successful social change campaign, what do you think are the elements? So if, if I was trying to lead my campaign, like, what do you think, um, what are your battle tools, <laughs> basically? Um, well, like I said before, like, know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. um, and be, be really clear about what it is, um, and, you know, simple is best. Have a have a simple goal. Um, make it airtight, and then um, you know it, uh, share it as much as possible. You know, privately, publicly. You know, and just just keep going. And, and relentless. That yeah, being be relentless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and only and you've got to focus on one step at a time. And that's a motto that I apply in every aspect of my life. You know. Whether it's, whether it's running and trying to get through 100 k's a week in my marathon program, like it's just one step at a time. You know, you can't, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the bigger picture, but the bigger picture hasn't even fully formed yet, right? And every step that we take is actually an opportunity to change direction entirely. So mm -hmm. why worry about 10 steps down the road when you could be looking a completely different direction? So yeah, compartmentalizing. We've laughed a lot about this question that I'm going to ask, and I'm struggling not to laugh at it now, but I'm going to ask it. Do you think government impedes social change? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Scott's probably got my phone bugged by now, so I really don't care. Um, no. Um, do I think governments impede social change? Yes, and worse, they make performative gestures to look like they're on side and making change, when actually it's just a load of crap. Like inquiries, for example. Inquiries are just great scaffolding to protect people 
from asking questions about things they don't want questions to be asked about. You can't talk about that as a subject of an inquiry. How convenient. Or defunding something, and then two years later, coming in and giving partial funding and pretending to be the saviour when not even giving a, a you know a fraction of what was you know given before uh, stuff like that or, or the you know when they did the cabinet reshuffle earlier in the year and you know they made this women's task force and they put Amanda Stoker on there and Amanda Stoker is a woman who's publicly supported the uh, commentator that platformed the pedophile that abused me and many others before me. You know, it's just tokenistic rubbish, really. Sorry. I'll tell you how I really feel about it later. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? You know, the role of grassroots activism plays in kind of being a counter narrative to that institutional power that just does not want to give. Well, that's, that's how change really happens, you know, and that's, it's, it's where it starts, you've got to start somewhere. Um, and, yeah, I think, I, I think we've already answered that question. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Should we be talking to our government or should we be starting our own government somewhere else? Well, look, governments come and go, you know, but we the people, we, we stay true. What is the significance, Grace, of empowering local voices to kind of participate in these wider global movements like Me Too and Let Her Speak? Um, you know, you've kind of already spoken about that, but you know, you're a local Tassie voice. Like, you are Tassie's first Australian of the year, and it's a big deal <laughs> for us. <laughs> That was the one thing that made me slightly competitive when I heard that Tasmania had never won before. I was like, that's some bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> We've got, got great people here, yeah. including yourself. So thank you for winning it on behalf of our state. Um, <laughs> yeah, local, local voices, that, like empowering the importance and significance. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, look at, okay, so this is a great example. So right now, we're seeing the national conversation is really focused on sexual abuse and sexual assault, and I think we can tra trace that back to here, to Tasmania. You know, we're a, a state of half a million people um, in a country of 25 million, and we started this, we, we sort of ignited this to that level that it actually got traction. And it just goes to show it doesn't matter how small it matters why. And if it's fundamentally good and right, it doesn't matter how small it starts because the truth will out and it will ultimately prevail. Yes. My Pentecostal wants to just say amen, but <laughs> it's out now. Amen. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, Grace, 2021 times like leader of the year like that's extraordinary like congratulations not only are you putting tassie in australia you're putting tassie you know in the new york times like in, in in the world so what's next for you and do you see your work changing the way you approach advocacy in the future um well advocacy is always evolving um mm. in accordance with i suppose the the, the timelines um Right now, um, I am working on a campaign, um, we're calling it the Harmony Campaign, and it's a campaign to um, standardise certain legal definitions um, at a national level. So currently we've got, including the Commonwealth, nine jurisdictions, and as such we've got nine very different definitions of consent nine different definitions of sexual intercourse, nine different definitions of the age of a child, as well as the age of consent to sex, and different definitions of grooming. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, grooming isn't even defined at all. And we wonder why we can't teach these things, and we wonder why we're using milkshakes 
as metaphors. <laughs> you know, just bang, bang my head against the wall at the moment. Um, but so if we achieve these, you know, national definitions, um, that's something that, that that's something that needs to be done in order to actually reform more specific legislation, because that's one of the, the roadblocks that I came across earlier in the year when I was looking at, you know, what are the priorities, um, you know, in terms of sexual assault legislation, what things do we need to be focusing on, and I was looking at certain pieces of legislation and realising that the wording and the terminology is not consistent. And I'm going, well, how can we reform anything if this is, means something here and it means something else here? And, you know, we can't educate around any of these things either if they're not understood or there's no, um, you know, consistency on them. So starting with and having a yardstick, you know, with which to then move on and reform other other legislation so hopefully we can achieve these things and i do i have a meeting with the um the attorneys general on the 22nd of october yes i already met with the federal attorney general um getting the ball rolling there and, and um, getting onto the premiers as well so yeah that's fantastic yeah um and you see education flowing from that well education is always happening you know mm. we don't need is it we need to be careful, you know, we're, we're just teaching people to, um, you know, follow the law. That's yeah. a bit dangerous. We obviously need to be learning about empathy, mm -hmm. some more than others. Um, but, you know, we can always be educating. Um, and, and campaigns are a great way to educate. So regardless of, of whether or not, um, you know, certain legislative reform is achieved, if you're, through media advocacy, constantly bringing an issue into the limelight, education will flow on from that. And as we know, education is our primary means of prevention. So, um, yeah, they go hand in hand, I suppose. Yeah. What are your hopes and dreams in regards to your own advocacy work now and the work of your allies and partners? Well, ultimately, I actually don't want to have a job, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be an advocate for survivors of child sexual abuse because I don't want there to be survivors of child sexual abuse. So if I can make my job obsolete, mm. then that would be great. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening too soon uh, with you know, current leadership, uh, but I'll keep trying and I'll never give up. Mm. If I have to, you know, if I have to die doing this, I will. One step at a time. Yeah, one step at a time, that's right. Mm. This is my Final question. Grace, this question is for the people in the room who are thinking, I know I have a story and a voice. It needs to be heard, but I feel scared speaking up. I'm afraid to put myself out there and engage in whatever movement it might be, whether that's let her speak or me too. What would you say to them to help build more courage? It is scary. You know, fear, fear is a very real thing. Um, you know, but you can still, you can hold fear and still be brave. I like to think of, you know, fearlessness as not being so much an absence of fear, but a refusal to let it stop us moving forward. Um, you know, fear protects us in many ways, but we all share that fear. Um, and just reminding people that, you know, it sounds trite, it sounds corny, you hear it all the time, but it really is true, you're not alone. And sometimes all it takes is that one connection that you make, whether it's with a stranger or a friend, um, you know, or a family member. If you make that connection and share that story, often you'll realise too that if you take the first step, and and you you might think that you're the only one that has that story, and you might think that the person that you're disclosing to doesn't understand or has no first-hand experience of, of what you're going through or have been through, you might actually realise that they have a story too and they were just waiting for somebody else, you know. So you'll never, you, you know, you'll never be able to catch a fish if you don't cast out your line. Thank you, everyone, Grace Ted.